England's Lake District is one of the prettiest parts of the country, as we'll show you in our driving tour that's going to be visiting most of the lake of this wonderful area in the northwest of England, sharing with you some astonishingly pretty views. We'll also visit some of the small towns that dot this landscape and we'll take you on a boat ride from one end of Oldswater to the other. It's the second largest lake in the Lake District, although it's only nine miles long. So you'll find that the Lake District is relatively compact in size. It's about 30 miles wide and about 40 miles from north to south, all included in the national park that was created in 1951. There are no admission fees to the park without any restriction on the movement of people into and around the district. The park was created to protect the environment from excessive commercial or industrial exploitation, preserving that which the visitors come to see. And they have done a very good job keeping the landscape clean and green. While still allowing a lot of private property ownership in the park, and several hundred farmers, mostly raising sheep. Later on, I'll tell you how Peter Rabbit helped create the National Park. Tourism is the main source of income, with 16,000 workers taking care of 16 million annual visitors. While they do have the country's biggest lake, Windermere, the lakes are really not all that huge, which makes them more accessible especially when guided by a tour company like Mountain Goat in their minibus that will take you to all of the main sites without any effort on your part. We're going to show you a one-day trip summarized in this movie in which we see 10 of the major lakes. While it's called the Lake District for a good reason, that's the main attraction, there are many other sites to see like the old stone bridge, the beautiful countrysides we're driving past, the mountain streams, and lakes, of course. We'll also drop in on Market Day at the main town of Keswick, right in the heart of the district. We'll take you to the oldest known historic site, the megalithic circle of rocks at Castle Rig, built 5,000 years ago. Here are the main lakes and places that we'll be visiting starting right now in the capable hands of our driver guide, Kevin from Mountain Goat Tours. Only doing a two a day, a nice slow drive through Central Lakes, down past the shores of Windermere. That'll take us down some nice little hamlets and villages. First of all, having a look at Windermere, the largest lake in England. We'll be stopping and taking you out of the van frequently during the day so we can get some beautiful vistas and get our photographs with Windermere as the perfect backdrop. We were quite lucky on this fine day in May to run into perfect weather. Sunshine, blue skies, and no wind at this early time of the day with amazing reflections in the water as we drive by. Passing the Embleside Pier at Waterhead, which is a busy docking area on the north end of Lake Windermere, there's all sorts of pleasure boats, there's a marina. Here you can get the Lake cruise ship that will take you back down to Bonas on Windermere, as we show you in a different movie. Or you could even rent a canoe and go paddling around on your own. There are some ruins of an ancient Roman barracks in the adjacent field, but we're not stopping. We're continuing on heading into Ambleside Town for a quick drive through. Its population of a few thousand makes it one of the main towns of the Lake District. With many shops, restaurants, bed and breakfasts, pubs, and various hiking trails around it, making this a pretty good home base for your visit to the lakes if you wish. Ambleside is a deservedly favorite center for tourists of every kind with its natural beauty and convenient situation combined with its good road network rendering it one of the most popular spots in the Lake District. Its smallest residence is this historic mill house, at one time occupied by a large family. Numerous excursions can be made from Ambleside, such as to the Rothai Valley on the border of town, which is well wooded and watered by several streams, or you could walk up Wansfeld Pike, 
about 1,700 feet high that can be seen in a couple of hours. Within a few minutes of leaving the town of Ambleside, we're right away out in the country. It's typical of the rural scenery that we'll be enjoying for most of the day. Green rolling hills, stone walls, and sheep. Continuing along to Rydalwater. This is one of the smallest lakes in the National Park, just three quarters of a mile long and quarter mile wide, and it's the shallowest at 65 feet deep. But it is so beautiful that the poet Wordsworth lived at or near this lake for most of his time in the area. I'll say more about Wordsworth when we get to the next village, Grasmere, where he also lived. There is a footpath that goes all the way around the lake, and you can also hike in the nearby hills. The name Rydal comes from the rye grass that grew around it. Continuing on to the next lake, Grasmere, which is right next door, as we look down on it from the road up above, heading on our way to the town of Grasmere. The lake is so sheltered and peaceful and serene that just looking at it gives you a feeling of tranquility. If you're keeping track, that's three lakes we've seen already, with many more to come, Yet the scenic beauty of this drive is not just about the lakes, it's this rolling hillside, the beautiful mountains, the endless stone walls. They estimate there are about 7,000 miles of stone walls in the Lake District. First built, they believe, by Viking settlers and then maintained ever since for the past thousand years. Many of the houses are made of stone, some of them using a drywall technique where there's hardly any mortar holding the stones together. We next arrive in the small village of Grasmere, one of the most popular places in the Lake District, notably because of its association with William Wordsworth, who lived here in Dub Cottage and is buried here in the church cemetery, along with his wife and his children and other acquaintances. Wordsworth was born on the outskirts of the Lake District and lived here for 60 of his 80 long years amid the lakes and mountains, becoming a poet laureate of the natural landscape. Born in 1770, he started school here, then went south to Cambridge for college, graduated, returned to the Lake District, and made it his home. His nine years at Dove Cottage, living with his wife and children and sister, were among the most productive of his career. He called Grasmere the loveliest spot that man hath ever found. Grasmere is a charming little village, something right out of a picture postcard with its old stone buildings, quaint little shops, inns that go back to the year 1769. There's pubs, there's restaurants and there are quite a few vacation rentals available here. In fact, that's become an issue. It's so desirable for travelers that locals are feeling the pinch as their housing supply erodes away and gets converted to vacation rentals. It's ironic that Wordsworth was an environmentalist who tried to stop any mass invasion of tourism even back then in the 18th century, and yet he wrote poetry that made the area famous and then he wrote a guidebook that invited people to come in and go on hikes. So he bears some responsibility or blame or credit, as you will, for the growing popularity of tourism in the Lake District. If you don't want to spend your time in Grasmere's gift shops or drinking in a pub, there is a nice little stream walk right in the village itself, illustrating how easy it is to get close to nature when you're here in the Lake District. And all around Grasmere, there are many hiking trails for the serious exploration of the outdoors. A major award was bestowed on the Lake District in 2017 by UNESCO when they designated it as a World Heritage Site and recognized its outstanding significance as a cultural landscape. The award was based on several factors, including the beautiful topography with its valleys and mountains and streams and lakes, the sheep farming, which has created a landscape of enclosed fields and farms, and also because of the very strong environmental protections that have been in place for 100 years, which led to the birth of the conservation movement in Britain. 
Our next lake was a scene of some of those conservation battles because Thirlmere was a natural lake that was converted into an artificial reservoir when it was dammed up to supply drinking water to the nearby city of Manchester back in 1894. And there was a lot of controversy about it at the time and it still supplies drinking water to the surrounding communities. It worked out very nicely because the lake itself looks like a natural lake, just as beautiful as it ever was. We're very much in the center of the Lake District now, heading on to two of the most beautiful lakes, Durham Water and Oldswater, where we'll take you on that boat ride. Often when driving from one lake to the next, you're heading up out of one valley, over a ridge, and down into the next valley so the scenery gets quite rugged and grand as you get higher on the hills. Our driver has brought us up a steep little side road to a very special place where we can get one of the best views in the Lake District, looking at Derwent Water. The big island in the middle with the house on, that's Derwent Island. That was built by an industrialist called Joseph Pocklington, a Yorkshireman who built several houses here. Derwent Water, at 1.2 miles wide, is the broadest of the lakes, giving it more of an oval shape than the other lakes, but it's a highly irregular oval, broken by many a uh, promontory and bay, and on its surface there are four charmingly wooded little islands. Here's our lookout point. It sits in a basin surrounded by a variety of hills which impressed Wordsworth, who said that Derwent is distinguished from all the other lakes by the fantastic mountains around it of Barrowdale to the south, solitary majesty of Skiddaw to the north, bold steeps of Willow Crag and Lodor to the east, and to the west, the clustering mountains of Newlands. Just below that lookout point, you've also got to stop at Ashness Bridge. It's probably the most photographed bridge in the Lake District made from a traditional old-fashioned stone construction. It's been standing for hundreds of years. They suspect it was built originally in the smaller version for the pack horses going through the area. But it's so popular now, everybody knows about Ashness Bridge and has to stop here that it can be pretty hard to get a photograph of just the bridge with maybe a few people in there, not a crowd or a car. But just be patient, get the right angle, and you'll come home with a fine shot. We get a different view of Durham Water now as we're driving alongside it. You can also take a boat ride on this lake, which we have shown you in a different movie. For now, we're driving by, heading south, and then driving up another tall ridge over Honister Pass, one of the highest in the lakes area, and also with a road that's one of the steepest. It's a nice, warm, sunny day here in the month of May, but this area can have some ferocious storms, especially in the wintertime. And this pass actually holds the rainfall record of Great Britain for total rain in 24-hour period, 14 inches. This mountain stream is heading downhill where it will be feeding into our next lake, Buttermere, another one of the gorgeous watery landscapes. On the map, you can see the routing we're taking from Derwin Water going up over the ridge through Honister Pass and down along Buttermere. And then we'll go up another ridge through Newlands Valley, heading back up north to the town of Keswick. Buttermere is a small lake, some 2,000 meters by 400 meters, but it's a place of great scenic value, situated towards the head of the valley of the River Cocker. There's a pleasant footpath around the lake, which is about four and a half miles long. At one point, it takes you through a short rock tunnel. The name Buttermere is perhaps derived from a lake by the dairy pasture because of the fertile alluvial soil at both ends of the lake that supported dairy farming. Another connected lake just beyond is Crummock Water. Climbing up through Buttermere Valley, we reach a waterfall called Moss Force, one of the park's tallest at 100 meters high. So naturally, we've got to get out and take some pictures. Described as fearfully savage by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, another one of the great literary figures who lived in the lakes area. The upper valleys tend to be quite dry despite occasional heavy rains, 
But as you get lower, the fields turn a lush green, all watered by natural rainfall, primarily areas of dairy and sheep farming. The bright yellow flowers that we see almost everywhere along these roads and scattered in the fields look very pretty, but actually it's a noxious weed called gorse. Arriving in the town of Keswick, we'll be taking a lunch break here. And lucky for us, it's market day. Every Thursday and Saturday, it looks just like this. Very busy, lots of colorful market stalls selling food and clothing, handbags, dog leashes, lots of dogs in this town. But for now, in the movie, we're just stopping briefly. We have a lot more of Keswick we'll show you in our movie about the towns of the Lake District. But this movie is more about the lakes and countryside and some historic sites, such as Castle Rig Stone Circle. You're familiar, of course, with Stonehenge, a much larger stone circle and much more famous, but Castle Rig is actually older. In fact, it's believed this may be the oldest known stone circle in the British Isles. Dates back about 5,000 years. And yes, as you might suspect, certain rocks line up with the summer and winter solstice. So it was probably some kind of calendar in stone, but it was believed to be so special that it was a multi-purpose kind of place. Perhaps sometimes a gathering spot for the leaders. Also, it may have been some sort of a marketplace because this area was famous in the Stone Age for making excellent stone axes that were traded all over England. And there have been traces of the axes found here in archeological studies. It's nice that you can get right up close to the stones. You can even touch them, it's okay. Unlike Stonehenge, which is highly protected, as we've shown you in our movie about Stonehenge. Look for it in our collection. This afternoon is going to offer us yet more glorious scenery following up on the beautiful morning and lunch at Keswick. Departing Castle Rig now, as you see on the map, and we are heading down to a big lake called Oldswater, where we're going to enjoy a boat ride from one end of the lake to the other. It can happen that you grow tired of beautiful scenery if you're out all day and it keeps going by more and more hills and sheep and stone walls and farms, but in this case, it just seems to keep getting better. And maybe the best is yet to come. Driving downhill again and curving around roads with sweeping vistas that unfold mysteriously and majestically, coming upon one of the great sights of the day. The view looking down at Ullswater. It's so convenient to be in the hands of a experienced driver guide who knows the most scenic routes and has the timing down perfect so that we arrive at the boat dock just in time to get out of our minibus and stroll over to the dock and casually board the boat. Hemmed in between two great mountain ranges on the east and west side, Ullswater is second largest of all the lakes. Nine mile long and three quarter mile wide with a maximum depth of about 200 feet. It's similar in shape to Windermere, long, narrow and winding and comparatively level at one end and mountainous at the other, but it makes more of a sharp bend than Windermere, which divides it into three different sections. About midway, the boat makes a stop at the pier at Howtown. There are some hikers who walk part way around the lake and others just join in at this point. There's a few stops along the route Makes it convenient if you want to get out and take a walk and wait for the next boat coming by. It's operated by Oldswater Steamers, which has been running boats on the lake for visitors for 150 years. Many visitors find that Oldswater is the most beautiful of all the lakes because of its particular shape and being surrounded by mountains the way it is, with a walking path around most of it and this excellent boat service but it's tough to pick any one lake as the best. As you've seen, they're all quite beautiful in their own right. The complete ride takes just less than one hour and the time goes quickly, especially with that bar and cafe service down below and the different seats that you can pick indoors and out, pet the dogs, 
take a walk around the ship, enjoy the views, and before you know it, you've arrived at Glen Ridding, the end of the voyage. You can see the shores of the lake is a perfectly idyllic spot to linger and take a little stroll, maybe just sit on a bench and enjoy the view. Our journey is nearly done, but we have one more lake and we have another mountain pass to drive over and some more historic sites to enjoy on our way back to Windermere. Brothers Water is the smallest of the lakes and one of the least noticed because it's overshadowed by all the other wonderful lakes with their hiking trails, boat rides, and grand vistas, but it completes our list of 10 lakes that we saw on this one day tour. We've got one more mountain to climb, or at least a mountain pass to drive through. That's Kirkstone Pass. It's the highest pass in the Lake District at nearly 1,500 feet. And it does offer a grand view looking back at Little Brothers Water, which you can enjoy from the outdoor tables of a pub. It's the Kirkstone Pass Inn, the third highest pub in England. They offer a pint with a view, and you can have a meal here or spend the night in one of their rooms. As we come down from Kirkstone Pass, heading south, we're getting lower elevations, getting away from the dry, rocky hilltops, and down to Trotbeck. Looking down into the valley, there's a small farm down there, very important farm because it was owned by Beatrix Potter, the famous author of Peter Rabbit and many other stories. She lived in the Lake District for most of her life and played an important role in creating the Lake District National Park because she made a lot of money with her many children's books and invested that money in purchasing land, ultimately donating 4,000 acres and 14 farms to the National Trust, which has formed the basis of today's national park. Potter was also a champion breeder and farmer of Herdwick sheep and one of our first environmentalists. That rascal bunny Peter Rabbit is her most famous creation, so perhaps we can thank him for the park that we see today. However, he was very naughty. He ran into Mr. McGregor's garden, squeezed under the gate, ate some lettuces, French beans, and then ate some radishes. Chased away, he hides in a tool shed then makes his way across the garden and finds his way home, joining Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail, the good little bunnies. This was her first book and she had to self-print it because no other publisher would accept it. Then she added these famous illustrations and it was finally picked up and went on to become one of the best-selling books in the world with 45 million copies. Beatrix Potter was a lady of many talents, including business, where she invented the concept of selling merchandise to go with her books, such as her very popular doll of Peter Rabbit. Her main home was at Hilltop Farm, which is open to the public as one of the most popular park attractions. All in all, this has been a great day driving through the lakes with the help of our friends at Mountain Goat. They have a couple dozen excellent drivers and several different routes available through the district. The day can be summarized in a nutshell by looking at a satellite enhanced map of the lakes. And even more accurately, this satellite photograph taken by NASA shows the earth toned hills and mountains rising above the lower lying lands that are carpeted with green. The geology of the area is quite fascinating and begins about a half a billion years ago when this land was at the bottom of an ancient sea. I'll explain more as we have some final views looking down on Lake Windermere. 400 million years ago, the land emerged from the sea upthrust as giant mountains that were probably as high as the Himalayas today. But then erosion and tectonic shifts sent the mountains back down to the bottom of the ocean. And then they came up again about 300 million years ago, forming what are today considered some of the oldest mountains in the world. Not only did these mountains rise and fall, they also traveled north, probably beginning south of the equator about 500 million years ago. The landscape gained its present form of rounded mountains and hills about two million years ago when Pleistocene glaciers crept and covered most of mainland Britain. The glaciers advanced and retreated many times and carving deep valleys that filled up with meltwater and rain, thus creating the lakes that we can enjoy today.
Okay, I finished the geology lecture just in time to get us back to Bones on Windermere, the little village along the lake shore that's our home base for our visit to the lakes. Be sure to look for our other movies in this series, including one that explores the main towns of the lake, Bones, Windermere, Ambleside, and Keswick, all part of our longer series on England, Scotland, and Ireland.